Welcome back. So we're going to continue our discussion here with intermediate macroeconomics uh, with chapter five. And in chapter five, what we're going to do is we're going to put together our goods market, which we talked about in chapter three, and our financial market, which we talked about in chapter four, and come up with a model for the short run fluctuations of uh, the macro economy, right? Remember, we're talking about the entire economy now and also think about different policies, right? So we're going to be able to think about fiscal policy and monetary policy uh, as well. So what we want to do then is take this idea uh, of the IS model from the goods market and the LM model from the financial market. But in order to do that, what we first need to do is to uh, have a more detailed view of our IS market. And in order to do that, in chapter three, what we said was that investment was fixed. We just sort of assumed it was exogenous and it didn't depend on anything within the model. But now in chapter four, we've introduced the idea of the interest rate. And the interest rate we said in chapter four is really the opportunity cost of holding money. When the interest rate is high, you'd rather have bonds than money. When the interest rate is low, you'd rather have money than bonds. But the interest rate is also really important for investment. And now remember, when we're talking about investment here, we're talking about capital investment. We're talking about investments in things that will allow you to produce more goods and services. And so that's business investment. So buying everything from factories to machines to trucks to computers, um, but also residential investment, building new houses, right? Because new houses provide housing services. And the interest rate is going to be really important there, especially for housing, but also for other investment as well, because it's really the price of investment. And we can think of it either as the price of investment if you have to borrow, like if you have to get a mortgage to build a new house, or you have to borrow from the bank uh, in order to build a new factory or buy new machines. Um, but it's also the price of investment even if you don't need to borrow because it's the opportunity cost, right? Do you build a new factory or do you buy bonds? Well, if the interest rate is really high and you've got a lot of cash standing around, well, you might just want to buy bonds and get that interest rather than build a new factory. But if the interest rate is really low, then you're not going to get much from buying bonds, so you might as well build a new factory. Also, we want to think about the relationship between GDP uh, and investment. So the idea here is that when GDP is high, income is high, and both people are more likely to build new houses and businesses are going to be more likely to uh, invest in producing more because they expect people to be able to buy more. So we have this new function for investment, which says it depends on GDP with a positive sign, meaning that when GDP is higher, investment is higher and the interest rate with a negative sign, which means that when the interest rate is lower, investment is higher. And when the interest rate is higher, investment is lower. So now we can put that into our equation um, where, so now we have Y equals C, consumption, which depends on uh, Y minus T, which is disposable income, investment, which depends on Y, GDP, and uh, the interest rate, and G. So that's now our new IS relation, a little bit more um, complete. And notice that we're still assuming that G, government spending, is exogenous because that takes place uh, in the political process. So. This is really similar to what we had in chapter three, right? The only thing they did differently in the book here is give the demand curve a little bit of a, a curve rather than a straight line, because now it's not only consumer spending that depends on output, but also investment spending. Um, so we've got this upward sloping demand curve. We've got our 45 degree line still, uh, and we've got A where the two cross, which is our equilibrium. But actually what we're interested in is uh, graphing our IS um, relationship, not in the sort of output and demand space, but in the output and interest rate space. And so that's what we're going to do next, right? Um, as we can see, you know, they say, okay, we got a curve now rather than a line because we got both consumption and investment. Um, it's a flatter um, than the 45 degree line because we have, you know, extra income leads to extra demand, but less than one for one, but we still have that same type of equilibrium. So now we're going to say, okay, well, what happens in our graph up here in panel A when the interest rate changes? 
So if the interest rate goes up, that means that investment goes down. When investment goes down, that means GDP goes down and we move down to a lower equilibrium from A to A prime. And then we could say similarly, when the interest rate goes down, investment goes up, GDP goes up, income goes up, and we move to a new equilibrium A. So basically what this says is that when the interest rate is higher, GDP is going to be lower. And when the interest rate is lower, GDP is going to be higher. And so we can translate that into what we're going to call the IS curve. That's here in panel B, um, where it's just a downward sloping curve that says output is higher when the interest rate is lower and output is lower when the interest rate is higher. So we have this downward sloping uh, IS curve. So this is going to be important because we are also going to be able to uh, graph the LM curve in this uh, type of space, right? With output on the horizontal axis and the interest rate on the vertical axis. So let's think about what might shift the IS curve. So remember that the IS curve comes from our equilibrium condition in the goods market, Y equals C plus I plus G. Um, so we can think about shifts in government spending, shifts in uh, autonomous consumption, or shift in taxes, uh, which is the example here. So when taxes go up, that means that people have less disposable income. Less disposable income means that they have lower consumption. Um, lower consumption means lower production, and we get a shift to the left uh, of our IS curve. Um, similarly, if we had lower taxes, that we would expect it to shift to the right. If we had higher government spending, uh, we would expect to shift to the right or lower government spending, we would expect to shift to the left. Um, so anything that is exogenous in our model, uh, government spending and taxes being the two main ones, but also what we called C0, right? Autonomous consumption uh, would be another one. Um, that's going to shift our IS curve either to the left or to the right. And this is going to allow us to think about what happens uh, with fiscal policy, especially, right? Fiscal policy is in the goods market. It involves government spending and taxes, and so that's going to shift our IS curve. So we just want to keep in mind, just the same way that we needed to keep in mind in microeconomics, um, the difference between a shift in the demand and supply curves and movement along the demand and supply curves, we need to do the same thing here with the IS curve. So a change in the interest rate is going to be a movement along our IS curve because the interest rate is on that vertical axis, it's an endogenous variable. Um, whereas anything that's exogenous is going to shift our IS curve. Um, and so government spending, taxes, autonomous consumption, those will be shifts in the IS curve. But if we say, okay, well, what if the uh, interest rate decreases from 6% to 4%, that would be a movement down the same IS curve because the interest rate is already in uh, that IS curve.